Epstein's anomaly, the best disease. Everything you need to know about Epstein's anomaly is on this slide, okay? This is what it is. The leaflets are displaced apically and they're horribly dysplastic and they can be tethered and they can be leaky and they can be stenosed. But the two things, everyone's eye is drawn on echo and when you see these patients to the enormous right atrium. But in fact, that's of almost no consequence except for arrhythmia. What's of huge consequence is the tiny left ventricle. We published many years ago that that left ventricle actually has fibrosis in it, a lot of fibrosis. So it's not just that it's squashed by the right ventricle, it's actually fibrosed as well. And this thing, the small right ventricle, the thing that determines how people with Epstein's anomaly do is not how big their right atrium is, or not just, it's how is their functional RV doing and especially how is their LV, their underfilled fibrosed LV doing. So please don't think of it just as a disease of the right atrium. Now, the reason I think it's really cool is it's about the only disease I can think of that has an entirely different presentation according to what age it presents at. So in the fetus, it either presents as high drops and intrauterine death or with an abnormal fetal scan. In the neonate, it causes cyanosis. In the infant, it presents because of a murmur or heart failure. In the adolescent or adult, it presents with arrhythmia. And in the old adult, it presents because someone finds the ASD and the right heart overload and this is the Epstein. So it's really got age-dependent presentation and that age-dependent presentation translates to age-dependent outcome. So what are the key features that determine outcome management and prognosis? I didn't call it the Selamire Index. Please believe me, others did. So if you do an echo, four-chamber apical view, and you simply trace the area of the right atrium and you divide that by the area of the other three chambers, you can come up with an index. It's a number. As Greg Scalia says, in echo you just divide something by something else and present a number. And if you divide the right atrial area by the rest of the heart, you get a number. And basically, if it's over 1.5, you're cooked. If it's over 1, it's pretty bad. If it's under 1, it's OK. It's a very surgical summary, wasn't it? OK. So um, then you need to know the tricuspid valve function. You need to know the size and function of the functional RV, that bit of the RV that is pumping, that has myocardium. Even some of it will be above the valve. That's important. I shouldn't skip over that too quickly. The valve is displaced, but the ventricular muscle is above where the valve is tethered. So when you put the valve where it's meant to be, you've still got some RV, and that's really critical. Size and function of the LV arrhythmia burden and the number and nature of any associated anomalies. Now, this is the overall survival, if you take all comers, and this is the largest series yet published from Great Ormond Street in London, but divided up into the groups, and you can see fetal diagnosis, terrible outcome. If it's diagnosed when you're zero to two years old, there's a 60% mortality by age two years. If you're diagnosed between two and 18, there's an 85% 18-year survival. And if you're diagnosed when you're more than 18, there's about an 85% 35-year survival. So it's very dependent on the age of diagnosis. Now, there are only scarce data on the adult outcomes in Epstein's anomaly because it's a rare condition and because there's early attrition in severe disease, as I just said. But it is compatible with asymptomatic long-term survival in mild disease. When you look at the literature, however, it mostly comes from places like Great Ormond Street or like the Mayo Clinic, where obviously only the most severe cases are referred. So those are so skewed towards the bad cases that they're almost valueless when you see a patient in your rooms with Epstein's anomaly and you say, well, your chance of being alive in 20 years is only 15% or whatever, because that's what the Mayo Clinic says. And obviously all familiar with that problem. Um, the biggest series in the adult literature until very recently was 49 adults followed up for 11 years. Half of them had had tricuspid valve surgery and half of them had had SVT. Uh, so they were a very morbid group. But when I returned to Australia, I just have to, I just, can I just check, Christian Brizard from Melbourne is not here, is he? Okay, because the last time I presented these data, he stood up afterwards and said, Salama, you're an idiot. Okay, so many of you will say after this, maybe this is an idiot if you're a French surgeon who is very, very good at French surgery. And I'll tell you why. So in about 1995, when um, an electrophysiologist called Mark Maguire, who many of you will know, 
and Richard Chard and I thought about how to manage adult Epstein's anomaly, the three of us came up with a proposal. This is classic congenital, non-randomised, just do what you think and see what happens approach. Because you can see the numbers aren't big enough to randomise and the condition is too heterogeneous to randomise. So we prospectively define a strategy of watchful waiting, which is that we would only intervene if the patient had refractory symptoms, particularly if the valve was repairable, and not just if the echo looked awful. So we have people who we've been watching for 20 years where the echo looks terrible, but they can still play tennis and they're okay, and we haven't intervened on them. And that's what Christian Brizard objected to, because he said, I can fix this and they'll be much better. So we have, no, he might be right. He might be right. I don't want any of you ringing Christian and saying, do you know what that guy said about you? <laughs> Hi, Christian, Melbourne. Okay. So 51 cases with 21 years follow-up. To get in, you had to have been at least 16 years and be seen once since January 2000. And many of them had associated abnormalities, as many people with Epstein's anomaly did. So um, over half of them had an ASD and a lot had right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. A quarter had had surgery in childhood, and that was usually tricuspid valve surgery, although a couple had had ASDs closed. Now, they were, they were quite severe. If you look here, about half of them had severe dilatation of the RA, a Selamir index over one, and 15 had moderate RA dilatation. Only less than a quarter had mild or no RA dilatation. And about 40% of them had a small LV, which we defined as an LV in diastolic diameter of under 40 millimetres. And the overall survival, go figure, it's good if you watch and wait. We had three deaths. Uh, one was a 58-year-old woman whose Epstein, that's what I was saying, ASD was repaired when she was 10, and the, the Epstein's, it was probably detected, but it was never told to her, and it wasn't in the op note. So we diagnosed the Epstein's when she was 55 and presented with atrial fibrillation. She had a tricuspid valve replacement and a STAR procedure. She had terribly severe disease at diagnosis and, and died about day 30 post-op with a poor LV and MR. A 45-year-old girl who was diagnosed at age seven years, who got AFib after the second pregnancy and was treated with a beta blocker and actually was quite well, but then didn't turn up for follow-up for six years. And we only know that she died of heart failure, but we know no more than that. And a 72-year-old man who died of something else. Arrhythmia is common and, and has many varieties, which are challenging to treat. 35% of our group had SVT and it wasn't all atrial flutter. It's well known that 10 to 20% of them have right-sided WPW, which is difficult but amenable to radiofrequency ablation. So 30% had RFA, some at the time of operation. And there was persistent sinus rhythm in only half of them. So it is a difficult group for ablation. And five patients had a permanent pacemaker and one from an AICD. What about tricuspid valve surgery? Most of them, 50% of them, had surgery in adult life at some point. So they did develop refractory symptoms or they did develop problems that required surgery. The surgery was either repair or bioprosthetic tricuspid valve replacement and, and Richard will talk about the decision making around that. And the time from diagnosis to operation was long and so the mean age of surgery was quite late. Finally, the controversies about Epstein's. Uh, I'll show you the cone repair. The slide's slightly blur uh, blurry, but what the cone repair is is a new way of repairing Epstein's where the tethered tricuspid valve leaflets are freed up all the way along. So the surgeon goes in along the RV endocardium as if it were a cone and strips up all the tricuspid valve tissue to try and make a really good mobile leaflet and then puts in an annuloplasty ring at the level of the valve and plicates the rest of the tissue to try and create a competent valve with a really large functional RV. And that's the latest version of repair which has very good early results. So the controversies are whether the cone repair should alter the threshold for early surgery, how best to assess the functional RV size, I mentioned that that's important, and cardiac MRI is useful for that. Um, this is a little technical, but sometimes when Epstein's anomaly is repaired, the right heart doesn't cope well because the dynamics of the right heart has been changed and the right heart isn't used to having all the blood going through it and putting the SVC onto the pulmonary artery is a, a get out of jail free card with that that's called a bidirectional blend, and that's designed to relieve the burden on the perioperatively injured RV. And the last question, when the LV is just too small, you know, you look at some LVs and you think that will never get off the pump if you, if you intervene, and we don't really know when too small 
is really too small. So in conclusion, if you do see Epstein's anomaly, it's actually compatible with good long-term survival. Although data are scarce, our single centre experience suggests that you can get quite reasonable outcomes with a symptom-driven indication for in intervention. Thank you very much.